Thank you very much for coming. Our, this is a program for, this is a webinar for librarians, and our title is To Be Well Read, You Must Be Well Fed. Our lines are going to be muted for this presentation, so we encourage you to post your questions and comments into the chat box. We will have time for questions at the end, and questions that are not um, addressed we will follow up with uh, through email or post something on on a website since this is webinar is for librarian staff you know we we just have to recommend some books to you so crenshaw is a virginia reader's choice book for 2017 and 2018 it's by katherine applegate it's available in english and in spanish it's about a family that's dealing with hunger unemployment, homelessness, frustration, anger, fear, pride, and loss of dreams. We really do recommend this as a, as a way to get an insight into what it really feels like to um, be dealing with issues around hunger. The other book that we would like to recommend is The Last Stop on Market Street. As you can see, it has won several awards. It's about finding contentment and beauty in life. CJ, the little boy, asks lots and lots of questions, and his grandmother responds in very gentle ways. Of course, the last stop on Market Street is a soup kitchen, which CJ and his mother volunteer at. My name is Enid Costley. I'm the Children's and Youth Services Consultant at the Library of Virginia. This webinar is on the Food Service Program, and I would like to thank the Institute for, Institute for Museums and Library Services for providing materials to support libraries in Virginia, and I'd also like to thank the Library of Virginia. One of the goals of the Governor's Office is to eliminate hunger in Virginia, and this is what quote from our governor. Virginia students are hungry to learn, but they cannot learn if they're just plain hungry. Now, his wife, the First Lady of Virginia, is also a very, very strong supporter of eliminating hunger in Virginia. And one of her big programs is the Summer Meals Program, Summer uh, Breakfast Programs, and of course, the Summer Food Program. And I would say that a, a lot of, she has a very, very strong supporter and has visited some of our libraries. Our presenters, are listed here, and we have Sarah from No No um, No Kid Hungry Virginia. We have Brett from the Virginia Department of Health. We have a library director. We have a branch manager. We have someone who is in charge of youth services. We have representations from a rural library, an urban library, a library with multiple branches, a library that is standalone. Um, this webinar will be posted with sound online. When we talk about the summer food program, we often tell what we do. Sometimes we talk about how we do things. And oftentimes, we don't talk about why we do things. Taking inspiration from Simon Snick's book, Start With Why, we're going to give you a framework of the summer food program. We will share why we do things, how we do things, and what we do about the summer food program. So to provide us with some basic information is Sarah Steely from No Kid Hungry Virginia. She is our point of contact, contact for the summer food program. She is helping libraries connect with partners for the summer food program. Thank you so much, Enid. I am thrilled to be here today. I love working with the library system, but even more than that, I love working with Enid. And I can't get started without saying a big thank you to her for all of the hard work that she did organizing this webinar and for all of the amazing outreach that she's done for the Summer Food Service Program so far this year. All the outreach materials that you've received, the webinar that you're listening to now, those were all her brainchild, and she is as much a member of the No Kid Hungry team as I am, and we couldn't do this work without her. So thank you, Enid, Very kind of you. for all of that. So as she said, my name is Sarah Steely, and I am the No Kid Hungry Virginia Outreach Associate, and I love working on the Summer Food Service Program. Um, the No Kid Hungry campaign is a public-private partnership that consists of the First Lady of Virginia, Dorothy McAuliffe, the Virginia Department of Health, the Virginia Department of Education, and a bunch of corporate, 
public and nonprofit partners, one of which is the Library of Virginia, and all of you on the phone, you are members of the No Kid Hungry team. And together, we work to end childhood hunger in the Commonwealth of Virginia. And we do this by connecting hungry children with federal programs, federal childhood nutrition programs, such as school breakfast, after school meals, and the Summer Food Service Program, which also goes by the acronym SSSP, or the Summer Meals Program. And that is what we are here to talk about today. So I'm gonna spend the next few minutes covering the nuts and bolts of the program. As Enid mentioned, my fellow presenters will be covering more of the why this program is important and why it is so valuable for libraries to get involved. But we can't cover any of that without some background on summer hunger in Virginia, as well as the guidelines and expectations associated with serving summer meals through the SFSP. So let me kind of set the, the stage for you. In Virginia, during the school year, there are approximately 533,000 children who qualify for free or reduced meals. So that means during the school year, they have access to school breakfast, lunch, supper, if it's served, and they can count on those meals to fuel their bodies and their brains. When that last bell rings on the last day of school, those meals end. So those kids and teens don't know maybe where they'll be getting those meals in the summertime. And what does this mean you know, for them in the summer? Well, that would cause me a lot of stress and anxiety, and I would have a hard time you know, spending time with friends or enjoying the freedom from homework if I was you know, hungry and my, and my belly wasn't full and I had a headache. So uh, you know, they might not be operating at full capacity in the summer because they're dealing with hunger. It also might cause discipline challenges for the community because these kids are um, you know, misplacing their energy uh, because hunger is dictating how they're acting rather than the warm weather and the free time to spend with friends. Um, it might cause health issues, um, extra money spent on doctor's appointments. They might get sick easier. Um, and there's something called the summer slide, which is a loss in edu educational momentum that can occur over the summer when kids aren't in school. And I know as librarians, you're familiar with this because some of the summer slide is attributed to a, you know, a lack of a lack of reading um, or a lack of uh, instructional time. But if kids don't have nutritious meals to, you know, fuel their brains, um, that can also contribute to the slide. And that can set them, uh, you know, set them behind their peers when they get back to school in the fall. They might lose some of the lessons that they've learned and opportunities that they had from the prior school year, and that can be cumulative. So when a young, you know, a young low-income student reaches middle school and they've experienced several summers of this this slide, um, they could be several grade levels behind their peers. And Hunger is also hard on families who have already tight budgets and then are faced with the additional food needs in the summer that come with having kids at home um, and kids, you know, not uh, eating school meals. So most low-income children actually do spend their summers at home, um, up to 80%, and most eat lunch there too. And of families that participate in the free and reduced lunch program, more than half report through this study that you can see here. You can click on that link later if you're interested in learning more, but more than half of those families find it harder to make ends meet in the summer because they're spending more money on food. Some of them uh, say they're spending over $300 more, as you can see there on the graph. So hunger is hard on everyone. And this, the Summer Food Service Program, isn't the whole answer, but it's certainly a piece of the puzzle. So let's dive into that now. The Summer Food Service Program is a federally funded, state-administered program that provides free meals and healthy meals to children 18 years old and younger during the summer months to make up for that loss of um, the school meals that occur when, when school is in session. So let me introduce you to kind of the cast, uh, uh, the cast, the key players who participate in the Summer Food Service Program. 
the money and the budget decisions start with Congress. And from there, the money is uh, sent to the United States Department of Agriculture's Food and Nutrition Service. And they sort of um, develop the overall policy and publish the requisite rules and regulations that accompany any federal program that relies on um, taxpayer dollars to execute. So from there, the Food and Nutrition Service parcels that money out to the states who individually decide what agency is responsible for administering the program. Here in Virginia, we have an incredible team at the Virginia Department of Health who administers the Summer Meals Program, and I am so lucky to sit there with them. I am not a state employee myself, but the No Kids Hungry team helps them to amplify all the amazing work that they are already doing, like connecting new libraries with the Summer Food Service Program. And I highlighted the sponsors and the sites because this is a really important relationship and one that will be uh, really uh, you know, close to your experience with the Summer Food Service Program should you decide to participate. So let's dive into that a little more closely. Who is the sponsor? The sponsor is an organization that has experience with managing a food service program in the sense that they might have a fully operational kitchen or a large amount of refrigeration space. Um, they have experience making meals. And this might be a school nutrition department or a food bank or a parks and rec program that has a, an operational kitchen. And to be a sponsor, uh, you must enter into kind of a, a legal contract with the Virginia Department of Health to actually provide these meals through your program. And sponsors have a lot of responsibilities because they have experience, pardon me? Because they have experience preparing meals, they buy the food, they prep the meals, they uh, make sure those meals reach sites um, where kids are during the summer and, you know, are having fun and, and enjoying their free time where they can actually eat and enjoy the meals. And then sponsors are then reimbursed for the meals that they serve. So they submit claims to the Virginia Department of Health who reimburse them um, based on the number of meals that they've actually given out. So where do sponsors serve these meals? They serve them at the site. And the site in this situation is both a, a who and a where, but you, the library, are the site. The site is the place where kids are during the summer. They could be at summer school. They could be at recreation centers, playgrounds, parks, churches, community centers, day camps, um, low-income housing communities, uh, migrant centers, libraries. and uh, sites often tend to offer some sort of educational and recreational activity uh, where kids of all ages can participate so that they can eat and hang out with friends and take part in those activities that are offered. The SFSP is designed to not be a, a heavy administrative list on the site and the sponsor picks up a lot of those responsibilities. We want you to focus on actually serving the meals and spending time with the kids during the summer. The sponsor handles so much of the background responsibility like finances and paperwork. But on the site end, kind of the largest things that you're responsible for are um, recording meals when they are received from your sponsor, um, making sure meals are delivered at a safe temperature if they're not shelf stable. Um, and you also take a meal count at the point of service, so just recording how many meals are actually being distributed to the children at your site. And your sponsor is responsible for training you on all these details, so don't worry about taking notes right now or remembering all of this. Your sponsor is obligated and enjoys working with you to make sure that you understand everything that you need to do to make your program a success. So the last two is the kids. Um, who can receive free summer meals? And that is children and teens 18 years old and under. No charge, no money exchanged, no questions asked. You don't need to ask them for a proof of identification. You don't need to have them on a roster. They don't need to show you proof that they are hungry and, and qualify for these meals. You can just serve them food, which is a beautiful thing. One stipulation of the Summer Food Service Program is that these kids must actually eat the meals on site. There is a congregate feeding requirement, meaning 
communal. And, and the purpose of that requirement is two, kind of twofold. I mean, there's many reasons, but one, you want kids to be sitting together or sitting with their families and having conversation and thinking about the food that they're eating and enjoying spending that time together. And also, we want to make sure that these meals are ending up in the bellies of the hungry kids that they're intended for and not being taken home and maybe saved for later or shared among older family members. So um, they do actually have to eat their meal there on site at the library. They can't take it away with them and, and save it for later. Some sponsors do allow you to serve meals to adults. That's a question we get pretty frequently um, and is a, you know, a special nuance, but uh, you could work with your sponsor if you decide that that's something that you feel that there's a need for and that you're interested in doing. So we kind of already covered the hierarchy, but I love this graphic because it shows you the site there in the middle. You are the nougat at the center of the candy. You are um, maybe a healthier example. You're the artichoke heart, the, the most delicious part, but you are where kids are during the summer. You have direct contact with them. Um, this is a big bureaucratic program, but it all comes down to you and the connections that you have with the members of your community, which is really invaluable. So let's talk a little bit about where. This isn't so important for libraries, but I do want you to, to understand that there are different types of summer food service sites. Um, in general, libraries are open sites, meaning that any kid can come to the library and get a meal. It doesn't matter where they live in the state of Virginia. Um, it doesn't matter if they're enrolled in a program. They can just walk through your door and get a meal that day. There are other types of sites uh, depending on eligibility. Um, so for a site to be open, it means that it has to meet one of two criteria. It has to be either located in the attendance zone of a school where 50% or more of the children attending that school qualify for free or reduced meals, or that area has to meet a certain poverty threshold um, in terms of census data. Um, there are other examples though. There are closed enrolled sites, meaning that area might not meet the, the eligibility requirements, so there's a roster involved or there might be a camp, but you just need to know that you're an open site and um, any kid can walk through your door and get a meal. And I just wanted to show you quickly this website, which I linked to on the previous slide, is how we determine eligibility. So if you're wondering, you can just go ahead and type in your address in this search bar. And let's do this here. Um, I'm typing in my address. Don't write this down. <laughs> so if I wanted to serve meals at my apartment, the pink means that it is an eligible site. If it were to be right across the street in the blue, it wouldn't be eligible. Um, but that's how you can tell. The pink is yes, the blue is no, or you might have to talk with the Department of Health about um, options to, to serve meals there, other site types. So let's move on to the when, timing. The program is really flexible and it is customizable to your needs. Um, summer meals are served May through September, so any time when school is not in session, but the time of day that you actually want to serve your meal is totally your call. Do you have a, a scheduled preschool story hour at 11 a.m. and that's when you want to serve your snack? Great. Talk to your sponsor about that and share your preferences. Do you want to serve five days a week? That's awesome. If you only want to serve two or one, that's also a possibility. It is um, flexible and meant to be adaptable to your needs. What are we serving? We are serving free summer meals and the options are breakfast, lunch, supper, and then an AM snack and a PM snack. And if you are ambitious and willing and interested, you can serve any combination of uh, two of those meals. So you could serve a breakfast and a lunch or a an AM snack and a supper, you just can't serve lunch and supper. That's the only combination that is restricted. Um, and then the meals do have to follow meal pattern requirements, much like school meals do, um, you know, with certain components of grain and uh, vegetables and fruit and dairy and all that. But that is not for you to worry about. It is the sponsor responsibility to make sure that meals are comprised of the correct components. It is your responsibility as a site to make sure that the kids 
take all of those components. So if you hand a, a kid a lunch bag and he hands you back the milk, um, you would have to say, you know, no, you actually do have to take that milk. Um, but uh, after that, it is up to the child to decide what he or she wants to do with it. So he could um, you know, give it to another child or maybe put, place it on a share table where um, other kids could um, come and eat those other options if they're interested, but that's something that you would have to talk to your sponsor about to see if they are interested and willing to allow you to have a share table. So this is kind of a, a very, very um, vague, undetailed 10-step process for how to get involved, but you are already um, you know, ahead of the game by attending this webinar and expressing interest with, with Enid that you, know, you you're thinking about being involved, which is great. And if you do decide to move forward, then the Virginia Department of Health and No Kid Hungry would work to connect you with an existing sponsor in your area. So you are completely able to go out and find a sponsor on your own if you want to, but we do have a list of the folks who are already um, enrolled sponsors in the program, and we'd be happy to link you up with someone. Your, uh, your sponsor will then connect with you to kind of get a little bit of information about your planned operating days and what time do you like to serve meals or snacks, uh, your planned closures and any field trips that you have coming up. So maybe if you're going to be closed a couple days for the 4th of July, that all needs to be recorded. Um, what type of meal you'd like to serve if you're serving a snack, about how many meals you're going to serve, so how many kids you have attending, um, and any staff points of contact that they need to know about. And this all doesn't have to be set in stone. Um, that is completely flexible and you just would work with your sponsor to amend um, those details over the summer as they change. So one of the biggest things I, I wanted to touch on is number six, you and your sponsor publicize this program because now that you've learned what the program is and, and how to get involved, uh, it's the time to get the word out and make sure that the kids are actually connecting with your site and aware that it exists. So you have a couple different options. Uh, you know, you don't have to do all the publicity on your own. As libraries, you have a population of kids who are already at your, your site every day. They're there for the reading program. They're there checking out books. So um, talk to those kids and, and link them up with your meals program. This page that I have here, the 877 number, this is a, a Virginia-wide and, and nationwide number that connects kids with the meal site closest to them. So I texted it yesterday, and there are no sites in the system quite yet because it is um, early in the year. So that was the text message that I got back. But later in the summer, when sites are logged in, you would get the address, the closest meal site to you. So that's being publicized by state agencies and national agencies and nonprofit groups you know, all across the nation in the state of Virginia. And another way um, to publicize your program is through your own outreach and marketing. And at the end of last summer, Enid worked with the Virginia Department of Health to survey some of the library sites that participated to collect information on their experience in the SFSP. And it was a really phenomenal report because it gave us a great picture of, you know, what days you're serving and the sorts of activities that you're putting on. And it also gave us suggestions on how we can better support you. So one of those suggestions was to develop um, a marketing and publicity toolkit of some sort. So um, draft Facebook and Instagram posts, um, graphics for printing, press release templates, radio spots, that sort of uh, material so that you don't have to do it all on your own. So I won, I took a stab at, at developing that and we'll be sending out this media toolkit uh, when we send out the recording from this webinar, but I just wanted to show you that this is an overview of what it will look like. You have some background on the meals program, you have some social media best practices and about 20 pre-written tweets or Facebook posts that you can customize for your program the sort of official hashtags affiliated with the program so that if you use these, we can click on them and see all the collective publicity across the state of Virginia. Other tags that you could put in your post, like the first lady, she would love to be tagged in your, in your Facebook uh, posts and your tweets. 
some images for your Facebook and Twitter. So this top photo is a, a, a Twitter cover, cover photo, and this is a Facebook cover photo, an Instagram post, and then just sort of a graphic for a brochure or your website or whatever you'd like. And I left blank space for you actually to go ahead and input your own information, your own meals and time. And I made two sets of those, and I'm happy to make any more for you uh, based on your needs and kind of the own graphics that you have available. Here are some flyers with the 877 number on them. Again, those are nationally distributed. So these are from the Share of Strength, which is the nonprofit that runs the No Kid Hungry campaign. Some graphics for your own usage in your brochures and, and pamphlets, and then some templates, press releases, media advisories, and radio spots. And I'm happy to, again, help you with any needs that, that you have. You are not alone in this. So we talked about, apologies. We talked about all the good things that are going on with the Summer Food Service Program. And last year in Virginia, we actually served 3.8 million meals to hungry kids at uh, 1,400 individual locations through 139 sponsors. And those are incredible numbers, and they are a real testament to all the hardworking and, and amazing people who are involved in the program. But even with those big numbers, we are still only reaching 13% of the Virginia kids who rely on free and reduced meals during the school year. So I, I mentioned that there are 533,000 kids who qualify for those meals. Um, we're missing approximately 87% or around 463,000 kids, which is why we need more sites to get involved. And um, I'm thrilled that, that you are interested in thinking about becoming a site this summer. And I think that that's enough reason to get involved right there, the numbers, but I think it's important for you to hear more why stories from the other presenters. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Enid. Next slide, sure. <laughs> Wayne Crocker is our first presenter. He is the director at the Petersburg Public Library. In 2015, Wayne received the James Partridge Outstanding African American Informational Professional Award. It was presented by the Citizens of Maryland Libraries and, and Maryland College of Information Studies. His, this award, which is a very, very prestigious award from an ALA organization, it was for his dedication and community activists while well, he was director of the Petersburg Public Library System, where he still works today. So, Wayne, if you would begin. Nope, Wayne, you just have to go ahead and unmute your own line. Hold on, Wayne. That was completely on me. My apologies, sir. Are you there? Yes. Beautiful. Sorry about that. Oh, no problem. Um, good morning. I'm, I'm happy that Enid asked me to be a part of this webinar and uh, to talk about the experiences in Petersburg. And even though we've been doing this program for um, for a couple of years, uh, I've learned a lot this morning about the program, and I really appreciated the the previous presenter. Um, the next slide talks about um, the uh, food deserts, and uh, by many accounts, Petersburg is considered a food desert, and that's defined as areas where people cannot access affordable and nutritious food. They are usually found in impoverished areas lacking grocery stores, farmers markets, and healthy food providers. Food deserts contribute to food insecurity, which means people aren't sure where their food will be come from will come from. And according to feedamerica.org, food insecurity is also defined as an economic and social condition of limited or uncertain access to adequate food. And so we find that a, a lot of children, especially in Petersburg, are experiencing um, this food food desert. And on the next slide, it talks about food insecurity. And food insecurity rates is the percentage of the population that experience food insecurity at some point during the year. 
And so you can see from this graph that Petersburg had the highest food insecurity rate among the localities represented in the chart. And for many people, especially children, this meant that they did not know where they were going to get their next meal or when it would arrive. So that made our participation in the summer food program even more important. On the next slide, um, for the past year and a half, uh, the Petersburg Public Library was a part of an effort to bring the city leaders, the local school system leadership, and other community stakeholders together to look at some of the issues facing the children of Petersburg. The overarching goal was to ensure students arrived at school ready to learn. We quickly determined that children uh, will have a better chance of learning in school if they were stably housed physically, uh, mentally, and emotionally healthy, safe, happy, and lastly, but most importantly, well-fed. So we developed uh, several work groups that address, one, housing stability, two, uh, enhanced um, access to health care, three, improved nutrition and access to meals, four, transformed school climate, and uh, number five, holiday planning. And the library was very, in, uh, very involved in two of those work groups. One was the uh, holiday planning and the um, impoverished nutrition and access to meals. And on the next side, throughout our discussions, uh, we found out, and even teachers admitted that many, many students in the city came to school hungry. And so as the governor uh, often says, it's hard to address learning if, if a child comes to school hungry. Uh, and for many, many children, uh, the meals they received in school was their, was their best meal of the day. And as we begin to continue to talk about uh, the summer, on the next slide, we also realized that during the summer, many children, were, when they were not in school, would have difficulty getting a meal, period, much less a healthy meal. And so we talked about how we could address um, kids not having uh, access to a meal or a healthy meal during the summertime. And we also talked about, and the next slide uh, references our efforts to also talk about holiday planning because uh, we further realized that children underwent a significant amount of stress prior to the holidays. Uh, even for the holidays like Thanksgiving, whereas many children were looking forward to a big Thanksgiving meal, including the turkey and all the fixings, many children were not looking forward to not having a meal at all because again, their best meal was provided by the, by the schools. Um, next slide. And the more we talk with the school leadership, the more we begin to understand that as children, um, came, as the holidays became closer, their discipline um, issues became greater. And many of those discipline issues included behavior issues that led to both short-term and long-term suspensions. And so we began to look at what we could do to keep kids from getting suspended in school, which means they fell behind in their schoolwork and they just um, uh, were not being a, a part of the whole school culture. And so on the next slide, we, we began to talk about what we could do. And the more we talked, the more we feel the library had to become very active in the holiday planning and the, and the um, other work group whose purpose was to reduce the uh, stress associated with holidays and the summer by creating positive opportunities and resources such as programs and also um, meals. Um, and we felt we could uh, feed them at the library. We we had uh, some reservations because we were sort of short-staffed and we were wondering how we could add another responsibility onto the staff. But with the cooperation of the uh, uh, Feed Board program and other volunteers, we felt we could achieve this. And so uh, we did not want kids to worry about 
what am I going to eat this summer? Where is my next meal coming from? And we did not want them to uh, to also worry about uh, being disconnected from their friends. Uh, this was also causing a lot of stress, and um, and and not have to um, worry about other things. Uh, but uh, our main concern was keeping them connected, fed, and uh, out of trouble. On the next slide, it it shows some of our activities. Many of them were STEM related that we uh, had work with uh, organizations in the community to to help us provide so that kids um, not only would um, not have stress about um, not having a meal, but where can I go? What can I be involved with? And, and all of these were leading to the suspensions in our, in our local schools where kids were um, stressing about um, what am I going to do? A lot of families um, plan big vacations and they go off and visit grandmother uh, during the summer and during the, and during the holidays. And many of our kids in, in the city uh, did not have that luxury. And so the library became an outlet for many kids in the community during, during those times. On the next slide, um, we even work with the um, our local bus transportation system, Petersburg Area Transit, to provide a, uh, a a bus pass, and and during our discussions, we came up with a um, catchy name. It was called the Magic Pass. And if you had a, a Magic Pass, not only will it give you access to transportation on the local uh, bus system free of charge, and and but you could uh, you could uh, come to the library and you could check out books and materials. And you could also go to the YMCA and participate in many of the activities that the YMCA was having um, for children during the uh, during the holiday and during the summer as well. And so this became a, a very uh, popular item to have, and that's this magic pass. And we'd like to uh, continue that again this summer. Our next step. Um, and we're in that process now of trying to determine uh, what difference is the summer feeding program having in the community? Are we actually keeping kids from being suspension, suspended? Are we actually keeping them from um, getting into trouble? Um, so we're tracking um, that with our local social services, school system, police departments to see what impact uh, our efforts are having on crime rates um, especially juvenile crime rates during these uh, during these times, as, um, and um, also uh, in the schools, what impact our efforts are having on the uh, disciplinary data that uh, we had looked at before, and hopefully these are leading to uh, indicators, which means uh, these programs, uh, feeding programs, and activities are uh, reducing the stress among children in our community. On the next slide, um, we had a, a big launch, launch of our uh, summer feeding program, and um, in in the city of Petersburg, I think it was at Robert E. Lee School last year. Uh, we were fortunate enough to have some very influential people come to Petersburg and promote our summer feeding program. Uh, in this picture, uh, you see. Uh, first person was the U.S. Agric uh, Agricultural Secretary, Tom Bilsack. Um, beside him was the U.S. Education Secretary, John King. Um, and by, beside him was First Lady Dorothy McAuliffe. Uh, then we have uh, Congressman Bobby Scott. And uh, we also had a local councilwoman, uh, Councilwoman Tresker Wilson-Smith. And so it was a total um, a community effort um, reaching all the way up to the U.S. Uh, government to uh, to launch this food program in the city of Petersburg. On the next slide, uh, you can see that more than 1,000 children in Petersburg will get free breakfast and lunch this summer as a part of the uh, funded uh, program by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And this this program again is geared towards students who may not have access to healthy meals uh, during the summer. And uh, on the next slide, you see a, a quote from uh, First Lady Dorothy McAuliffe, who, is, who has been to Petersburg uh, on more than one occasion to promote this program. And her quote says, for lots of children, summer means more time to spend with friends, 
maybe summer camp and travel with family, more time to play outside, and just enjoy being a kid. But for many students, losing access to school breakfast and lunch can make summer full of worry and apprehension. And that's what we found to be true in the city of Petersburg. Thank and I think you. that's it for. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Wayne. Thank you yes. very much. Um, so you are going to be participating in the summer food program again this year, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, we we consider it a integral part of the uh, of our summer reading program now, and we will be a part of it this year. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for your presentation. Yes. Our next presenter is from the Central Rappahannock Regional Library System, Teresa Kane. She is the Youth Services um, Department Head. She has presented at the Virginia Library Association about the Summer Food Program. She serves on Ch Capital Choices Committee, which promotes note noteworthy uh, literature for youth. She coordinates school outreach, including storytelling, back to school events, and of course, the summer reading program. So welcome, Teresa. Thank you, I'm so glad to be here. I'll go ahead and get started right away with uh, what my library is like. Uh, it's an urban library in a small historic town. And uh, Fredericksburg is about an hour north of Richmond. And the library itself is in uh, a 100 year old building that had been a school in our historic district. Um, and if I could give you uh, one thing that would encourage you to participate in a program like this, it would be that I've never done anything in my entire career that was this appreciated by our customers. Um, the picture is worth a thousand words and I could just be quiet and go home now. Uh, <laughs> but I never miss an opportunity to tell people how wonderful this is, how wonderful it's been for our library and for our customers. Um, you get a great level of customer appreciation. You get people in the library who would never come otherwise. And plus, there has no, I've never had any kind of a program that increased my summer reading stats like this one. So it was kind of a win, win, win. You just stack those wins right up and um, you'd be surprised how many there are. I, we've served uh, every weekday for the summer at two o'clock in the summer uh, for the summers of 2015 and 2016 and we are on board for 2017. I can't wait. Uh, if you could go to the next slide, you'll see that uh, you have uh, an endless array of choices. I, for ways to serve your community. If we could go to the next slide, please. Um, and you may be wondering why you would choose a summer food service and how that might fit into your library's mission. Um, you've heard a lot about uh, the difficulty that uh, it's just almost an endless uh, hurdle that these children face. I, and food insecurity is at the heart of a lot of learning related issues. Um, and if we could go to the f no, next slide, that would be great. I don't think I'm supposed to switch them. Okay, there we go, yay. <laughs> um, and uh, these difficulties, of course, are magnified anytime they don't have access to the free lunches at school and breakfast. Uh, and if you could imagine facing the holidays and the weekends, and worst of all, the whole summer long. Um, and it's very difficult. Uh, it's not easy to uh, see who is food insecure because people will do everything they can to hide it. They're embarrassed. Um, and so, but I really want to focus on uh, the good news, and that is that food insecurity is completely curable, and we really can make a difference. Um, if you're looking for, you know, there's an endless array of things you could be choosing to do. If you're looking for ways to justify this program, uh, I'm going to give you some information that you can definitely use. Um, you could put it in a nutshell and just say all of the work that we do to prevent summer slide is going to be in vain if the kids are too hungry to take advantage of what we offer. And uh, 
that's just a little piece of it. I created some library-centric goals for this program. I, and we were able to meet them because of the number of people that were attracted to the library because of the mobile cafe. And the first goal was people who'd never been to the library before would develop positive, warm relationships. If we could go backwards on the slides, that would be great. Um, the, the people who had never been to the library before would develop warm, positive relationships with welcoming staff members and become frequent users of the library. And uh, the second one was I wanted to increase summer reading participation, program attendance, and circulation by attracting new customers to the library, developing relationships with them, and showing and informing them about the library's offerings. And the way that we did that was by controlling the atmosphere. I wanted uh, my library to be like that house in the neighborhood where all the kids want to come and everybody feels comfortable, everybody knows your name, nobody feels left out, may not be uh, have the most elegant furniture, there may be some spots on the carpet and nobody's worried about that, they're just worried about the people that are there. Um, I wanted every regular participant to feel like they had at least one personal librarian, and that was a trusted employee who really made an effort to cultivate a relationship with them. And because they knew them, they could make sure that they knew what was available for free at the library that was of interest to them. So, uh, and again, my success in meeting these goals happened because of the number of new people that were attracted to the library because we offered the mobile cafe. Um, the, our provider uh, and partner was the Fredericksburg City Schools, and uh, B.K. Kiernan is uh, my hero. He is the guy uh, standing on the slide in the right in the black shaft jacket. Um, he uh, was already using the food truck to bring meals to very needy neighborhoods, and uh, he has quite the reputation for innovation, and he's the hardest working man in the business as far as I'm concerned. Uh, he asked our branch manager if we wanted, he saw he could do one more uh, uh, stop at the end of the day, and he asked my branch manager if we would be willing to take the two o'clock slot. And she leapt on it. I was a little hesitant, uh, but I am very grateful to Margaret Beatty for jumping in with both feet and dragging me in with her. It was the best thing that we have ever done, I think. Um, the food truck enables us to, ha ha to serve hot and cold uh, lunches uh, to places, they're delivered straight to the places that have no capability to store hot or cold food items, and uh, we certainly fit that bill. Uh, people always ask where BK got the funding for the mobile cafe. He got various small grants. Uh, he collected donations from his food suppliers. Uh, at the school, who supply food, food to the school systems. And then he also has the food truck fully licensed as a catering business, and he can raise money that way uh, to support um, the summer food service program. Uh, he's extremely innovative. The next thing he's got going on, and there's always something, uh, is a program where uh, at the middle school, where middle school volunteers are going to grow produce in a garden and a greenhouse that's located on the middle school premises, and that food will be uh, served to the kids who participate in the mobile cafe. So they will have locally grown produce um, that was cr um, grown by middle school volunteers. Really a cool idea. If you could progress to the next slide, uh, what we offered our customers was an exercise program the first year. We collaborated with the local parks and rec. Uh, we, if you could progress to the next slide, uh, we had uh, free books from the Soho Foundation, um, and Enid from the Virginia State Library uh, did, was able to get that for us, and we really appreciate it. That was a favorite thing. And um, the kids were able to choose that you walk up to the food truck just like a food truck you would see in San Francisco or some other urban setting, uh, and you get to um, 
choose from a, a menu that changes every day. They got six to seven protein choices. Uh, vegetarian and vegan choices were always available. They got fresh fruit, fresh veggies, whole grains, milk and juice every day. And sometimes they got a treat. And if we could progress to the next slide, I'll describe the sample plate. Can we progress to the next slide? I think we're having some difficulties um, with getting to the next slide. Uh, Which slide but they would were... you like, Teresa? Sorry. Pardon? Which slide would you like? I would like the next one. It says uh, what the customers received. The... There we go. Very good. Excellent. Um, the um, the, if you look at the trays at the bottom, uh, it's kind of hard to tell what they are, but the one on the left is a grilled chicken salad. Uh, yes, a grilled chicken salad with crackers, a banana, uh, chocolate milk, and uh, apple juice. Um, and what's in that cup is the grilled chicken. Uh, if you look at the one on the bottom right corner, that is a vegetarian option. It's a uh, cheese pizza with watermelon salad and plain milk um, and they've been very responsive anytime that we say oh the kids just really love watermelon uh, they have been great about making sure that we get that again and again and that's been wonderful and one of my favorite stories is uh, they served corn on the cob one day and the kids loved it so much that by the time they got up to the second floor where uh, we have all the tables set up, they would have nothing but a bare naked corn cob because they had eaten it before they could even get up to the tables that we have set up for them in the library. And when I said that to BK and his staff, they got really busy and it really is fresh corn that they shuck that day and cook. So uh, we got to have that many times once they found out how much the kids loved it. And what the library offers is uh, the friendly faces in the space and the do-it-yourself STEM activities. And this year we're hoping to add the Mobile Maker Lab activities. And so that's a lot of fun. So if we could progress to the next slide, I'll tell you more about what we did as a library. I have a wonderful teen volunteer coordinator, Jody Lewandowski. And uh, if we could go to the next slide that says what we did. Thank you. Um, she is wonderful at uh, coordinating everything that uh, all kinds of work that uh, I don't know. We are, she's so wonderful that we have actually become dependent on our teen volunteers. I don't know what we would do without them. Uh, she trains and schedules them to do all the cleanup setup, stocking the Soho bookshelves, and um, then uh, they also, uh, because we were a lot busier, one hour before the food truck came, during the time that it was here, it's here for 30 minutes, and then one hour after the food truck, the teens really were like superheroes to us. Uh, they helped us out with, they were our summer reading navigators and they did online summer reading signups and they recorded the minutes and the titles for us and distributed prizes and I, uh, did just an amazing number of very simple things that made it possible for the staff to focus on the building relationships with the customers. Um, the real secret to our success was interestingly managing the physical location so that we met those library related goals. If you look at the tables that are set up, uh, we didn't tuck them away in a separate meeting room. I wanted them to feel very much like they were a part of everything. This is not some special program for those poor kids over there. This is a program for everybody. And uh, we set the tables up right wherever we could. We commandeered all the existing tables and chairs and crammed in as many more as we could. Um, and I, the food is served outside directly from the food truck, but I knew I wasn't going to meet my goals unless I could get those kids to come up to the second floor where the youth services department is in my 100-year-old library. And um, so I had to get them up there. And so I worked out a deal with BK where um, being the wicked librarian that I am, I had all the utensils, napkins, and condiments available only on the second floor. So you could get your lunch 
outside, but if you wanted to have the full package, you had to come up and get it from me on the second floor or from one of my staff members. Um, the other thing that we I did was I, I did not use any volunteers for relationship building tasks. I, employees were the ones who were welcoming and greeting customers. They were informing everybody about free lunches. Uh, they spent time chatting with the customers inside and outside. The only exception was the summer reading navigators. I did use teen volunteers for that because I figured uh, we desperately needed the help. Plus, I, if you're signing up for summer reading, then you must have at least some relationship with the library. So I did make that exception. And now for the numbers. Um, if you're looking to justify this program, these statistics are going to be a great uh, way to help you justify it. Um, the first year we did this, my program attendance went up by 20%. My summer reading participation went up by 10%. Um, the second year, my program attendance decreased by 1%, but on the heels of a 20% increase, I didn't feel so bad about that. It was more like a little bit of a leveling out there. Uh, and the summer reading participation went up by 16%. Um, I cannot uh, promise you that every single bit of that, uh, the increase in those numbers was due to the food truck, but I can tell you this. I have no other reasonable explanation for that. Um, I really think that we owe it to uh, the, that type of success uh, with very library-centric goals to the fact that we did serve the community uh, in this unique way and we brought in people who were not accustomed to coming to the library at all. Uh, if you go to the next slide, I'll tell you more about the outcomes that we had. Uh, the parents didn't receive free meals, but they definitely considered themselves to be well served. If you look at their faces, uh, you can see it just written all over them. Uh, one of the things that BK, uh, our provider, uh, said about this site was that he saw more of the same families every single day, every weekday, than he did at any of his other stops. And to him, that signified that this location, the kids were absolutely dependent on these lunches. Um, if you look at the slide in the top right, you will see um, less than half of one single family. We had one family with 13 children who came every single uh, day that we had this almost. They had almost perfect attendance. Uh, and when they didn't come, we definitely missed them because there were 13 of them. Um, it was really exciting to see what we did for them. Uh, we built relationships with lots of people who would never have come here otherwise. Uh, and our new customers are starting to come to library events. They're getting library cards. They're using our computers. They're taking advantage of the learning playroom, and we're seeing them come year round. Um, my greatest increases in attendance were for preschoolers and teens. And that teen market, um, I think in most libraries, and we're certainly no exception, is that's a hard uh, market to garner. So that was uh, an especially welcome um, addition to our, our family here. Um, I, and I was also, we don't often have opportunities to give a lot back to our teen volunteers, but we were able to give them a volunteer opportunity that included a free lunch every day, and they were really happy with it. Uh, and as I, I had mentioned before, a free lunch is not necessarily something that you wouldn't eat if you could possibly get something better. For us, the free lunches have been really tasty, something we're really proud to be able to offer. Um, and as far as advocacy goes, we people are very curious about this. We got uh, in-person visits from the mayor, Virginia No Kid Hungry officials, and principals as well. So, and we even had one principal who came and saw this, saw a lot of her students here, and got so excited about it that she insisted on being allowed to ride in the food truck to the different locations and serve the kids. And that was just a, a huge, big, wonderful thing. Um, some of the things that I've learned is that 
you really do have the power to change your community. And you can use this program to change your community for generations to come, no kidding, because this is the type of thing that gets handed down because of the way that food insecurity affects people's ability to get an education. It affects their ability to get a good job later. And that affects their children's ability to be food secure. So this is something, you can put a stop to something that, or at least help to put a stop to something that would be handed down for generations to come. And I really think that we need to be focusing on things that have that kind of power and that kind of potential. One uh, tip that I would tell you, um, if you're a manager, you really want to guard your staff from burnout the very best you can. Summer is already your busiest season. So uh, one of the things that we did, we got that uh, time slot at the tail end of all the other stops. It was at 2 o'clock. It was our serving time, 2 to 2.30. And that didn't seem like an advantage at first. But then I realized that if I moved it forward, my staff would be eating at 10.30 or 11 every single weekday all summer long. And that having a uh, a regular lunch at a regular time gives them a very much needed break during the summer and I didn't want to take that away from them. So the two o'clock uh, time slot for us turned out to be a wonderful thing. Um, and also rely on volunteers to do anything and everything that doesn't require customer interactions. Uh, and if you are dependent on teen volunteers, you're gonna have better luck getting them later in the afternoon anyway. Um, and I would just close by saying there's things they don't tell you in library school. And I'll share one of those things with you. And that is you can spend hours and hours learning databases so that you can provide top-notch homework help to anybody who walks through that door. But when it comes right down to it, your customers feel like they've gotten the top flight service when you're standing by a heavy door holding it open so that their child can come into the library without spilling their tray of food. It's really all about how you make people feel when they come to your library that makes all the difference. And uh, with that, I am done, but I'd be happy to answer any questions later. Thank you so much, Therese. Um, we're just going to keep moving on. Um, Cassie is our next presenter. Um, she is a branch manager at the Mecklenburg County Public Library. Cassie was the first librarian and the first library to, to say, I want to be a summer food site. And when I, I remember when I, I asked her, why, why, why did you want to um, participate in the summer food program? She says, my kids come into the library and they are hungry. We give them granola bars to eat. And at that moment, I knew that Cassie and I were going to be able to work together and I would not only work together well, but that I would enjoy working with her. So I am so happy that, that Cassie is here to um, share with you some of the, her partnerships for the summer food program. Thank you, Enid. I want to thank you very much for having me involved in this presentation today. Um, this is a program that I feel very strongly about. I feel that we should do as much as we can to help fight in this issue. Our elementary school here in Boynton closed in 2008, sending the children to other local elementary schools. This has left no location here in Boynton for a lunch program to be held at. Our system has four, other, four branches altogether, three other branches. This does not, ugh, the do not currently take part in the program as they're located very close to a public school here in Mecklenburg County. All of the public schools, from my understanding, offer a free lunch during summer school for the public, even if they're not currently enrolled in the summer school program. Our population here in Boynton is very low, with a whopping 423 people as of 2013. We have no stoplights in this town, and we on average served 10 plus children over the years at our lunches. We partnered with our local public school system. We did a cold bag lunch once a week. I went to the schools to pick them up with milk, sandwiches, fruits, and veggies. 
a nice balanced meal. These are prepared at the school, then served here at the library by us. We have done only one meal a week due to the fact of low staffing. However, I would greatly like to do more if I could just get some more committed volunteers. There is paperwork, don't get me wrong, but it isn't hard to do. It isn't complicated. The schools here did a training every year and explained it all out very well. It's all just simply a formality. Check marks, filling out your name and address. None of it is at all scary. You can go to the next slide. I felt as though parents would be more willing to participate and not feel so self-conscious about the program with other programs being held at the same time. Therefore, we partnered with several local organizations. The United States Army Corps of Engineers sent a ranger over to do a water safety program. At the program, the children were taught how to wear life jackets, how to decide whether the life jacket was the right one for them, and what to do if someone was drowning. The next slide shows the Virginia Co Cooperative Extension. Our local ex cooperative extension is literally three doors over from the library, which makes it great for them coming and doing programs here at the library. And they came and did a family nutrition program, which taught the children about balanced meals. The Virginia Department of Health on the next slide also came and did a dental health program. It taught the children about brushing their teeth, taught them what were good foods to eat, and also helped to encourage them about balanced meals. These are programs these organizations offer for free and are wonderful educational programs to take advantage of. We began this program in 2014. You can go to the next slide. When it first began, and I hope to continue for years to come, reaching out to the children in our community. And that's all that I've got. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kathy and Co. Teresa, also, that was some wonderful information. I am honored to introduce Brett Mitchum, who is the training coordinator for the Virginia Department of Health. So Brett is responsible for working directly with the 139 SFSP sponsors. Um, that's something we had last year. We'd love to have more this year. But he gets them spun up on all of the rules and regulations and info they need to know so that they can run their programs and pass that information along to the site. So I asked Brett approximately 30 questions a day, and he is here to answer kind of any of the technical questions you have about the program, like is identification required, um, any questions about the meals or working with a sponsor, all that sort of stuff that you might be curious about. And I'm not going to open up the line for questions just because I don't want a bunch of voices at once, but if you do have questions, go ahead and type them into your chat bar and Brett and I will be able to see them and, and he can address them. So go ahead and do that now if you have questions. And Brett, do you want to say a couple words about libraries and the Summer Food Service Program? Um, sure. This is, you know, the, the Summer Food Service Program is probably my favorite program that we um, administer at, you know, the Department of Health. It's, it's just it's such a critical program because when you think about, you know, meals for children in need um, throughout the school year, there is a great deal of accessibility with regard to things like the school breakfast program, the national school lunch program, what have you. And then, you know, you get to summertime and there becomes this nutritional divide. And you know, the whole concept of the summer food service program is trying to kind of bridge that gap in nutrition so that, you know, when kids do get um, toward the end of summer and they're gearing back up for school, you know, they haven't spent the previous three months kind of hungry and not eating really good nutritious meals and kind of, you know, with this program, they're going back into school kind of ready to learn and excited about learning because they haven't had to, you know, kind of fear for where their next meal is coming from. And, you know, libraries are just such a great fit for this kind of program because it, it, it kind of fosters this this whole concept of, you know, continuing to learn through the summer and read through the summer. I mean, it's, it's just such a beautiful partnership. So, um, you know, I, I would, I would, 
wholly ask you guys to seriously consider becoming a part of this because you guys really fit into this picture just absolutely beautifully. So one question we got from Rick was, does site staff serve the food or does the sponsor? The CRRL example, which was Teresa's example in, in Fredericksburg, sounded like it was the sponsor. If the library staff serves, are there food handler training requirements? And that's a really great question because the mobile meals truck is a unique example of a, a sponsor. Is that correct, Brett? Um, yes, that is definitely kind of a different scenario. And really with things like mobile meals, it's it, it really depends. Um, and it really just depends on the sponsor and how their business model is set up. We do have some sponsors that do mobile meals and, you know, their team shows up and distributes the meals and what have you. But then we have other sponsors that, you know, they'll drop off the meals with the mobile meal unit and kind of have a site supervisor um, that would be a member of your staff uh, kind of oversee distributing meals. So it really kind of varies from sponsor to sponsor as to, um, you know, how meal distribution occurs. Typically, uh, the model is that the sponsors deliver the meals and then staff at the location kind of work to distribute those meals. And, you know, with regard to things like food safety and whatnot, it's really going to depend kind of on how the meals are packaged and provided. If you think about things like bag lunches, it's really simple to just kind of hand them out. But, you know, if you're going to be handling food products, um, typically you'll, you'll be provided with, you know, food safe gloves to kind of work with that product. So it really kind of depends. It's, it's, it all varies from sponsor to sponsor um, and how meals are provided and kind of what their business model looks like. Great question. We got another one from Olivia who asked, is there somewhere online we can go to look at the list of approved sponsors or do we have to contact No Kid Hungry or the Virginia Department of Health? And that's another great question. And I guess I would recommend before I pass it off to Brett is definitely touching base with us either way, just because we have the best handle on what sponsors are already at capacity for serving meals and might be unwilling um, to take on other sites this summer just because they're already uh, you know, operating at full speed. And then we might know of other sponsors who want to, who are looking for more sites and interested in, in connecting with more folks like libraries and YMCA's and Boys and Girls Clubs. Yeah, and so at present, there is not kind of a public list available. It is something that we are working on putting together um, to put out onto our website. But I would say for now, in the interest of time, definitely reach out either to Sarah or, you know, to the Department of Health in general, and we can definitely pull together um, a comprehensive list of folks that you can kind of reach out to and facilitate uh, getting onto the program. Absolutely. We have a question from Susan. Do you recommend registration for summer reading programs as an estimate of the number of children you may be serving? And, you know, you might want to weigh in on that one. Does, is that a good number of, of how many kids are in the library during the summer? You know that you have children who sign up for the summer reading program and, and then sometimes you never see them again. They've taken their their book list and they're they're visiting their grandmother or, or they're doing some other things. So you probably have a very good idea of how many kids come to preschool story hour, uh, especially the first day of the summer reading program where you've promoted it and you bring in in you know live snakes or you you really um, told them something really wonderful. You get more kids those days. Um, you also have a good idea um, of based on the number of people who call to see when their when the program is that how many kids are going to show up and when kids start showing up at the library like an hour before the program begins you know you have a good you're going to have a large crowd there so those are all things that you have in your um, library handbag that you kind of pull out and I think you could get a good estimate. But the thing I want to say is if you have food left over, that is absolutely normal. In fact, if you don't have food over, that is a trigger point for people to say, what's going on here? So don't worry about that. That's something you and your vendor work out. Um, 
and and that's kind of built in there. So you know, do do your best guess for the numbers. And Brett here is you're nodding his head. I know you can see him, but he's nodding <laughs> his head. Um, do your best numbers. But, yeah, that's that's really and. You know, sponsors are very familiar with this too. A lot of what they do when they take on new sites is they kind of have to, you know, get get this notion of what is the foot traffic going to look like, and you really just never know. It's it's hard to really get uh, an accurate picture. So it, it it is just kind of a ballpark figure. And then as you work through the summer, you kind of start to see what foot traffic looks like and you'll be in contact with your sponsor and talking about you know we use this many meals today and we ran out of meals today or we we have this much left over and they'll kind of work to adjust with you so it's you know you don't have to feel any kind of trepidation with regard to you know guesstimating what your foot traffic is going to look like Another question, does the physical location need to be in the approved service area, or if the library is located in a non-approved area, but the larger service area includes schools that are in an approved area, do they qualify? So the short answer to that is that the physical building has to be in an approved area, but Brett knows more about eligibility. So with regard to eligibility, um, it's literally going to be the physical location where you are serving the meals um, that is being qualified so that is the most important thing um, as far as that is concerned and that that it, it, it is a very just kind of simple answer it, it's all about where is the meal service going to occur and then determining the area eligibility based on that particular location So we have someone from outside of the Commonwealth on the line. Thank you so much for joining us. And Lindsay is wondering what part of this process is determined federally and what might vary from state to state. So really, these programs are driven federally. Um, the way it works is that, you know, USDA, FNS, Congress, they all kind of help to get regulation in place. We as the state agency, um, we just kind of oversee the programs and you know work to interpret the, the regulations to the best of our ability um you know figuring out what the fed expects to see from us so there's not a lot of room for state you know determined option um in these programs so you're not going to really see a lot of variance uh from state to state especially with regard to like site level information really it'll be more kind of at the sponsor level um and that's going to be things like you know how much vetting do um state agencies do of sponsor budgets and things of that nature and you know, refrigerate them, reheat them the next day, or, you know, if it's just sandwiches, you can use them the next day. Uh, you can donate leftover foods. Um, you, you, some sponsors just ask that you dispose of the food. Um, as far as kind of distributing any kind of leftovers, if that is the case, typically sponsors would really only allow uh, distribution of foods that aren't going to be potentially hazardous. So things like, you know, fruits, uh, vegetables, shelf-stable grain items, what have you, but things like meat products and whatnot typically would get disposed of, um, you know, just because if you think about it, uh, if you give a kid a ham sandwich and then they leave the location, you, you don't really know if they're going to keep that thing in their backpack for the next six hours and then eat something that's potentially hazardous. Um, so that's kind of, um, again, driven by the sponsor and what their protocol is with regard to leftovers. Some of them will, will even say that, you know, once you've served each kid their first meal, if you have leftovers, you can offer a second meal, um, that sort of thing. So there's a number of different options. It just depends on your sponsor. Awesome. 
that's all the questions that we have from you so far. Uh, we have a couple minutes left on the webinar, and I know Enid wants to do a wrap-up, but feel free to keep entering your questions, and we'll send out a summary of these kind of with the answers that Brett just gave so that uh, you can use it for reference as you're planning for your program this summer. Thank you so much, Brett. He is um, a wealth of information and so very helpful. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Enid for closing. We do, we are, we have some materials that we would like to give libraries that are participating in the summer food program. That includes a set of books um, that is, we're working with the Soho Center to provide for you that will be given out at the library director's meeting in April. We also have some things that we would like to mail you since our summer reading program is Read by Design. We were able to get some Kiva planks that we are putting in um, at least one in each of the libraries that is participating in the summer food program. If you have a, um, a science hub, you can, you can, we would give you the colored Kiva planks. Um, we also would like you to, when you do that, we'll be asking you um, some information so that we're gi giving some good information up to the governor's office as far as which libraries are participating, where they're participating, um, and, and that information. If you, if it, the information is not complete, don't worry about it. We can go back and we can edit things. That's not a problem. But I do would like you to get your, um, register for that before April so that we can make sure you get your, your set of books at the director's meeting. We're also going to be putting, um, some of this information online. The, the webinar will be put online. Uh, we'll make sure there's a link to, the marketing material and um, and if you have any questions please give me a call or email me uh, Sarah and I are in contact quite a bit and um, if I can't help you then usually Sarah can we also um, would each one of our presenters said that you could contact them and we would um, encourage you to do so um, if you have any questions you can just let us know. Sarah? I just wanted to kind of repeat one thing that Teresa said during her presentation. I wrote it down because it was so poignant and it deserves to be repeated. All of the work that you do at your libraries to prevent the summer slide is lost if your customers are too hungry to take advantage of it. That gave me chills. Um, it is, yeah. So this is what we want to see during the summertime. Kids with their bellies full, with with a nutritious meal, with uh, participating in a safe place, feeling part of the community, and ready to go back to school. Not only reading, have read books and participated in your reading program, but also with their brains developed and not have that summer slide. And we have just one more slide to show you. And that is a quote from the First Lady. Children can't be hungry for knowledge if they're just plain hungry. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us today. That's all we have, and we'll be sending out those materials uh, by the end of the week, hopefully. Thank you so much.